Uh, this morning, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to take a pause in our, our series on the Christian Atheist because I want to do a mid-year update for Atlanta Road Alliance Church. Um, we're halfway through the year, and there were a lot of things that we as leaders had told you that we were going to focus on this year. We actually met with you in February, if you remember. We had uh, groups. We came out to your life groups and talked about what are we planning? What do we think God is leading us in as a church? So I want to give you a little bit of an update on that, as well as a peek into the future. Now, uh, if you've been around, or if, or if you're new, um, but even if you've been around for last year, what we've been saying repeatedly, over and over and over, for the last uh, year and a half, is that we want to be a church where you can come as you are and be changed. The whole idea being that we want people to come no matter what situation in life, no matter what their belief, no matter what their experience, no matter what their history, no matter what they look like, uh, we want people to feel like welcome as part of our family. But we want people to change. In other words, it's okay to be not okay, but it is not okay to stay not okay. And so we want people to grow. And what we said is that we want to see this happen in a couple different areas. Uh, we think that if we're going to change, we want to grow in how we love God, which means we want to be transformed when we make this, this commitment to living out the truths of God in our daily life, which means we have to know what God says, but then do the hard work of putting that into practice. And when we do that, we begin to be transformed. And that was, of course, what Jesus told us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But he also told us to love other people, and so we want to be transformed in how we love others. And that just simply means we get transformed when we live to this incredibly high standard that Jesus set for life within the church. From loving to forgiving to doing conflict well, all those things that are uncomfortable for us, when we do them well, God changes us, and we grow. And then, of course, the last part, which was the main mission that God gave all of us, which was to go love the world, to make disciples of all nations. And so we'll be transformed as we embrace this purpose, both personally in our lives with the people we know, and together to make disciples of the world. So that's what we've been talking about. Well, how has that gone for the first six months of this year? Let me share with you some of the wins, I think, from the first part of the year. Um, because I think there's a numerous wins. And when I went through this, I thought, oh my goodness, we've had a lot happen in six months. So hopefully you'll feel the same way. Uh, we did some training. This is a part of how we, and I've classified in the loving God, loving others, loving uh, the world. Uh, we did some training. Um, and the reason this is a win for me is because we train people on learning to know more about themselves, more about who they are and how they interact with people. We now have over 50 people in our church that have gone through this. That's a big win because the more we understand about ourselves and how we interact with others and with God, we grow. We, uh, we had Christian growth classes. Again, we had numerous people that came. That's a win just because I got some people to teach some stuff, which is good for them. And a lot of us were able to process and learn and gain some more uh, information to apply to our lives. We did a 40 hours of prayer. You all remember that? We had a great time with 40 hours of prayer. I had numerous people afterwards tell me that the spirit of this facility shifted after that 40 hours of prayer for the better because people met with God here. We're going to be doing that again in the fall. I'll tell you a little more about that in a little bit. And we just had the Life Conference where we had teens and leaders encountering God in Orlando. You just heard their whole testimonies uh, last week. And if you didn't, you should go back and take a look at that. Fantastic. Big wins because they actually met, were convicted, and in some cases maybe had the course of their lives changed by God. Am I right? These wins? Seems to be, isn't it? All right. Well, we also had some wins in how we love others. We had, over, we had nine groups with over 60 people involved in life groups. It's fantastic. I had more life group pictures that I could have put up there that some of them were embarrassing, so I kept them small so you can't really see them, okay? <laughs> but we had groups that had a lot of fun, but it wasn't just about having fun. The win was that we had people doing life together, caring for each other, praying for each other. When Joyce went into the hospital and Scott had to go up there every week as she goes through all of her treatments, and they said, hey, people from our life group got together to pray for us. So meaningful, so powerful. And I've heard story after story through this entire year of doing that. We had new people. That's wonderful. That's a win, right? People who have said, hey, we, we like what God is doing here. We want to be a part of what God is doing here. Fantastic. And we had some big group celebrations. I'd forgotten about some of these. We had life group Olympics where I directly or indirectly was responsible for several people falling and injuring themselves. We had our church picnic, which is a great time together. We had our, uh, our uh, sight and sound trip. 
We had the missions weekend. The reason those are wins is that's the chance for us as the big family to get together and to be connected. Good stuff. But we also had some wins here. Loving the world. Gemstones Prom, first time we ever hosted that. I hope you do this next year. Talk to anybody who was part of this. This was an amazing event. Dealing with 90 uniquely enabled people and their families here, ministering to them. It was fantastic. Let them know that Jesus loves them. We had our movie nights. We're actually part of it. We've done two out of three. And I thought about this because you could say it wasn't a win in some respects because we would have loved to have more people from the community come. But it's a win because I have seen so many people talk to their friends, talk to their neighbors, invite, share, and build relationships. That's a good thing. And Youth for Truth, one of our life groups stepped up and said, we need to do something with kids this last year. It was fantastic. They're lining up to do this again in the fall uh, through this winter season. Amazing. Kids being loved on, being showed that Jesus cares for them and serving and growing themselves. That's a lot of wins, my friends. And there's some other side wins that I wouldn't even put in these categories necessarily. There's some general wins. We've had growing participation with other churches in our community. I think this is absolutely key in our current environment to be able to partner with and work with other churches to do different things, whether it's the Bible camp, the prayer breakfast, there's more things going on with that. That's been a huge win because anytime the body of Christ comes together, that's how Jesus designed it. We've done... Uh, updates on our website. I'm not expecting you to look at this at all. I'm just giving you an example here. Okay? But we begin to develop what are our discipleship pathways look like. And if you haven't been on our website or our app recently, take a look. Mackenzie's done a fantastic job. It looks more professional. It flows better. It's more clear on what it looks like to be part of this church family. That's a cool win because we want to communicate with the people outside and inside our church. And then, quite frankly, God continues to bless us financially. Our um, weekly giving exceeds our weekly expenses, which means that, our, that what we have available to us as resources continues to grow. So that, that cushion is going to help us with future ministry endeavors, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And uh, there continues to be significant giving towards missions and supporting families like we just saw in the video. That's a huge win. That's enabling the work of God both here and around the world. That's worth praising God for, don't you think? I mean, that's awesome. I mean, I agree. That's six months. But that doesn't mean we are where we want to be or where God wants us to be. There are some gaps. I have lots of these conversations with people around our church and with other pastors. I think there are some that are general and some that are unique to us. One of the issues that we have and gaps that we face is that how people view church and attendance and their involvement in church has fundamentally shifted in our culture. Coming on a Sunday morning is no longer a priority to a lot of people. People have engaged at different levels. Younger people don't see a service as kind of the thing to be at. They still crave connections, but they crave it differently and they engage differently. And that's a challenge for churches because we can't just say, well, we'll get better and we want people to come because they're not going to come. We have to learn other ways of interacting with them and it is simply not good enough to say, well, that's just how we do church and if you don't like it, you can go to hell. I mean, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I know people are like, hey, if you don't want to come, then that's your destination, that's where you're going. We can't do that. We can't afford to do that. Life has changed. People have changed. It's a challenge. It's a gap. Here's another one. This is specific to us. ARAC has aged collectively. This is the result of a long period. This is not new. This predates me. It predates a lot of us. But we have aged collectively. There's fewer children, fewer teens, fewer families. I think every single person that I've talked to in here says, oh, we want to get younger. We want to get younger. How? Especially when they don't want to come here. It's a challenge. It's a gap. There's been a lack of salvations and baptisms in this church for quite a while. Seeing the kingdom of God reach into the lives of people that don't know him. That there's hope. And because of the way this all works, we have some volunteers that have been doing the same thing for so long that they long for a break, but there's no one to fill the gaps. So what do we do? Because i got to tell you, we can be 
And, and a lot of churches are like this. They stay busy. They have programs. I mean, you saw all those things we did in the first six months of this year. Do you know we can stay totally busy for the kingdom of God, but busyness does not equal fruitfulness. Never has. But I'm convinced that doesn't have to be us. We don't have to be a busy church that accomplishes nothing. The goal is the advancement of God's kingdom. That's what Jesus told us to do, and that's what we're going to do. And I think that as we cooperate with God, I think there are amazing things in front of us. And so there is this um, fascinating account that I want to walk through with us this morning. Of, uh, in the, it's in the, uh, the time of the kings of Israel and Judah. Uh, it's an event that happens after Israel has split. So there's this northern kingdom called Israel, a southern kingdom called Judah, They've had their kind of civil war they've split, and they both have kings. The northern kingdom never has a good king. It's always bad kings. The southern kingdom of Judah has some bad kings, but some good kings. And in this case, it's King Jehoshaphat. And if you're familiar with your Bible, you'll know this story. He was a righteous king. He was a king that really was trying to follow God, but he was in trouble. As I want to pick up this story, it's in 2 Chronicles is where I'm going to pull it from, chapter 20, if you want to follow along. But it begins like this. It says after this, so after this whole engagement that you can read about with, with, um, with the northern kingdom, it says, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Meonites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and they told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already, in other words, this army's already on the move. And they're in Hazazon Tamar or En Gedi. Now this is not good news. Basically, these people from this side of the Dead Sea have gathered together, they've looped around, and they are coming up north towards Jerusalem. I mean, Jehoshaphat had an army, but it wasn't big enough, it wasn't good enough, it wasn't equipped enough. And it's easy to read this and just think, okay, they're facing a battle, but no, you have to understand, they're facing annihilation, slavery, the death of their families, of their husbands, of their fathers, of their children. I mean, it is a critical, awful situation. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. He proclaimed a fast for all Judah. And the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard. I love the specifics. That's how you know this isn't made up, right? This is someone who's actually writing this down and looking at this. And he said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. And then he goes on, I'm not going to read all of it, but he goes on to remind God of his history in dealing with this nation of Israel. And then he continues. He says, but now there are men from Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir whose territory you would not even allow Israel to invade when we came from Egypt. In other words, those hundreds and hundreds of years ago, you told us to keep our hands off. So we did turn away from them. We didn't destroy them. And see how they're repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession that you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And all the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. He says, look, we're simply not equipped to deal with this. We have this problem in front of us that we can't do anything about. And then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jew. I'm just not going to go through all that. This guy stood up, and he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, all you who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. And he says, you're not going to have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Now, we're going to pause the story right here. The reason I wanted to talk about this, this has so much application for where we are as a church. Because here's what happens. You take a look at the story. They face challenges that they could not solve on their own. This army was beyond them. Jehoshaphat admitted, he says, look, we, we, can't, 
We can't fight this. Their army's bigger than ours. It's stronger than ours. They're better equipped than ours. We have this potential for complete disaster. We have a problem. And I think for Atlanta Reliance Church, we stand at that kind of crossroads. We want to see people be saved, to get younger, to impact disintegrating families. We don't want to age out, drift away, and disappear. I want to be clear with you. I am not the solution to these problems. I, uh, I must confess I find myself completely inadequate to do anything to solve a lot of the gaps and the problems. And while I believe God's in control and they're God-sized issues, I frequently feel overwhelmed by what needs to be done. To get to where God wants us to go means, first of all, admitting that, you know what, there are gaps. There is an army. There is a problem or challenges or gaps, whatever you want to call them, in front of us that we simply can't just fix them by doing what we've done before. And then it's interesting to me what Jehoshaphat's first action was. And it's not like he had a lot of time here. The army was on the move. It was already in his country. His first action, if it were me, would have been, okay, who can we call that we know, right? Who do we know that has an army? And do we have money? Can we pay these guys? I mean, what are we going to do? Let's, where are we going to send the women and children? We actually should move them north. Let's get them out of the way. Let's pull the army down this way. You know, that should be their first course of action. That's not what happens. Their first step was, you know what? Let's go talk to God. <laughs> it says, Jehoshaphat's alarmed, you think? And he resolves to inquire of the Lord and proclaimed a fast. For all of Judah. In other words, he basically sent messengers throughout the country saying, stop eating, we're going to see God together. And it's amazing because it says people came from every town. By the way, if you read the preceding chapters, you'll see the contrast because in the preceding chapters, the king of Israel, bad king, tried to settle things on his own, king Ahab, and died in battle because he tried to do it all on his own. So instead, Jehoshaphat says, you know what, our focus must be on God, and so they threw themselves on the grace and the mercy of God and said, would you please show us what do we do? When we as leaders say to you, we want to grow prayer in our church, that is not a churchy thing. We have challenged you to pray for others, to be prayed over by others. Do you know this is not optional? It's so important. And there is no amount of service you will do in this church that will be as effective or yield the results of seeking our Lord in prayer. So, I mean, that's the challenge. Pray when you're alone. Pray when you're together. Pray for our church. Pray for yourself. Pray for our community. Pray for your place in it. Uh, the 40 hours of prayer thing that everybody enjoyed, we're going to be doing that again. The feel in the church changed. So this, this fall, I think it's in the first week in November, we're going to Pray. We're actually going to pray in a little bit of a different style so that we're going to finish our 40 hours of prayer. It's going to end with a celebration service on a Saturday night. We're actually going to be inviting you to fast this time for 40 hours along with it, which if you've never done, might be a little bit of a challenge. Come and do that. Sell out to prayer. Come pray on Sunday mornings. Do you know that on the first Sunday of the month, we gather in the prayer room at 930 to pray for our church? And I find it interesting that Maybe we haven't publicized this well enough and we want to continue this, but I'm asking you, once a month, come early, come pray. We're going to be doing more of that in the fall. And then, as I've challenged you, pray for somebody. Do you know, I had someone come to me recently. It was just fascinating. We had talked about prayer, and I was watching on a Sunday morning. As soon as the service finished, I saw someone walk across this room over to another person and talk to them and immediately begin praying for them. And I talked to her later, and she said, I just felt like God was saying, go pray for them. And I said, yes, that's what we're supposed to be doing here, other places. We're supposed to be saying to people, look, my life is a mess. Will you play? pray for me? That's why we tell you to join life groups. You know, life groups are not first and foremost about Bible study, even though we do those things. But in those groups, we have a chance to know each other, to pray for each other, to seek God for each other. So we do. That's not just the first step, it's the, it's the most important step in this process. Well, they sought God together. So these are the kind of things we want to do, um, to do in terms of praying and being prayed for. Well, they did this. They, they prayed. They talked to God, and then they get this answer. 
And uh, this prophet or this priest, he says, look, here's what's going to happen. Uh, I want you to take your positions. God got this battle. Um, and he says, I think this is fascinating, uh, you're not going to have to fight, so I want you to go out and just stand firm and watch. Do you know that's the worst battle advice ever given in the history of the world? Can you imagine? Hey, you have this massive army coming. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, I want you to go march out there and then just stand there. Right? I mean, it's just terrible, terrible advice. If you're trying to look at it from a worldly perspective, this doesn't even make sense. Why would you do this? There's no battle tactics, no strategies. I want you to go and stand there. That is really this battle strategy. See, as we've thought these things through, these gaps, these things we've talked about, the elders and leadership have, have, have thought through these things. We've said, what are we going to do? How, what is God trying to accomplish? And so I want to share with you kind of where we're going with that. So in, in prayer and discussion, our elders retreat and subsequent meetings, uh, we said, okay, God, we're going to continue on with the ministries of the church, and we need to keep praying, and we need to keep doing all the things we're going to do, but what's the thing that you're asking us to do to step in to fill the gaps that we just talked about? And here's what we came up with. We think there's a long-term plan, a four- to five-year plan, and it's simply this, stated as cleanly as I could make it, which is to plant a ministry in Seaford to meet the physical and spiritual needs of the young and the marginalized. In other words, God was saying to us, look, because the context has changed and people aren't just going to show up the way they used to show up, because you need to go where they are, not expect them all to come where you are, and that the group and the people in this community that are so desperately underserved are people that are young, our teenagers, our kids in the schools, and some of the marginalized groups in our community. So that's what I want you to do. Which sounds great until you start to think about it. And then you realize this is a big deal. Because here's what it means. It means it's going to be off-site. It's not going to be here. We have these amazing facilities that do so many good things. And God's saying, yeah, I want you to leave those facilities and go do something somewhere else. Somewhere in town. Somewhere where it's more accessible to people. We don't know where that is, by the way. It's going to be a subset of, uh, of Atlanta Reliance Church. It's not a church plant. We felt very strongly that God wasn't saying, go plant a church. He was saying, go plant a ministry. In other words, you're going to do something. It's going to be part of your church. It's going to be staffed by and used by and all that by your church, but it's going to be a ministry of Atlanta Reliance Church. Maybe it'll end up as a church plant someday, but that's not our focus right now. It's going to focus on young people, which means teens, college, and their families. It's going to be meaning having very targeted opportunities. In other words, we're going to be very specific. We can't do everything for everybody. And we're not trying to duplicate what other organizations are doing. We're not trying to do, you know, what, uh, what Love Inc.'s doing. We're saying, what does God want us to do? And I don't know what that's going to look like yet. Maybe it's ESL. Maybe it's an after-school program, literacy, tutoring. We're not entirely sure. But it will focus on that group of people. And it's going to be helping a diverse group of people, which can be very uncomfortable when you deal with people who aren't like you. Now, the reason I lay this out there, because I want you to understand where we're going, and we're going to talk more about this. This is a long-term plan, and so we're going to be leaning into this and kind of learning more as we go, but you need to understand where this church is going. Because here's some of the challenges. We're going to need to hire somebody towards this goal. I can't do this. So remember that nice financial cushion that we have? It's going to slowly go away. Because God's inviting us to say, we want you to do more. Our goal is to hire someone next year, and we don't know who that is. And it means we're not just hiring someone to fulfill the needs here. We're going to be hiring towards this goal of saying we need people to move in that direction. Which means that the things you're doing here, you're still going to have to do here because we're not going to hire someone to take your spot. It means we're going to have to use people and their energy from our current ministries because they're going to be people who say, look, I am, this is great. I'm in. I want to do this. Which means I can't do this thing over here at Atlanta Road. Which means other of you are going to have to step up or new people are going to have to step in. It means we're going to use those funds we've accumulated and we're going to have to grow if we want this to grow. We're going to have to have more people. We will have to rely on God to say we want to invite the right people in. We're going to have to find an appropriate and affordable location, which is not simple, right? We don't know if we're going to buy something or if we're going to lease something. We know we want it to be accessible to people, so it's not going to be here. It's going to be more that way. It's going to require increased partnering with other churches, which means we're going to have to invest again in those the relationships we're building with other churches because this isn't something we feel like we just want to do by ourselves. 
We're going to have to adapt our structure. In other words, how we do church, how we do leadership, how we integrate the leaders, the new hire, that's all going to have to change. That's all new and different. You're going to hear more about that because we're actually going to be talking about how we have to change our bylaws next year. And we still need to finalize and clarify the end goal because you say, well, then what does this specifically look like? I don't know yet. God is telling us, go out and we'll learn as we go. Those are some significant challenges, which is why we have to be praying. I could do a Q&A now. You could answer, ask questions, but I probably wouldn't have the answers. Let me tell you, this is both exciting and daunting and terrifying all at the same time. So what's our role in this? And I can't help but think of the same thing that comes out of this story. Do you know what they did when God asked them to move? He said they cooperated with God in obedience. I, if you, if you, I, sometimes what helps in these stories is to think of what they could have done. God gave them all these instructions. I want you to go out. I want you to march. I want you to uh, get your positions. Do you realize that if God had this battle, he could have told them to stay home? I got this. Go home. Watch TV. You'll hear about it on the news. Right? I've got it. But he didn't do that. He said, trust me. You got to do something. You got to leave. You got to put on your armor. You got to take your stuff. You got to walk. And Jehoshaphat said, okay, we are doing this. Not only that, we're in. So in fact, let's put the worship team at the front, okay? That way if the arrows start flying, right, hits them first, okay? <laughs> but he puts them at the front. He says, all right, if we're going to do this, let's put the worship team at the front of the choir. They'll sing as we go. But do you understand this was only going to work if they listened, if they obeyed, if they cooperated with God? He actually never gave them the option to disconnect and stay home. They had to go. They had to take a risk because they didn't know this was going to happen. God said, go stand out there in front of a big army. <laughs> okay, right? That's, that's a risk a lot of us wouldn't want to take. They had to use energy. They had to trust God. I shared this with you recently. It was actually in one of my weekly video blogs. If you don't know, I have a weekly video blog. You can subscribe. But and this has been on my mind more recently, is we as a church, and I do this all the time myself, and I've heard us do it, we frequently, frequently ask God for wisdom. We say, God, would you show us what to do? Show us what to do next. Would you give us wisdom? And I feel like recently God's been saying, you, need, you don't need more wisdom, you need more obedience. And I'll give you wisdom as you obey. And so as we as elders have talked about this, God says, look, I'm going to give you direction. I need you to start walking. Do what I tell you to do, and I will show you what needs to happen as I get there. I'm not going to give you all the details of the next four years today. It's not going to happen. And I think how many times we do that personally. We say, okay, God, give us wisdom, and then we have an idea, and we're like, yeah, I don't really want to do that. Give us wisdom. Please show us what to do, but not that. And I think sometimes God says, obey me. And of course, because I'm preaching this, he means he always uses personal illustrations, and so last week at the Bible camp, he said to me, I want you to go door to door, and I said, I don't want to, and he said, I don't care, <laughs> I want you to do it anyway, I said, all right, I'll obey, and you know what's funny, nothing spectacular happened, I didn't walk away with an epiphany, it was great, we got to minister to people, in the end, God said, thank you, you listened, it's risky, and it's uncomfortable to cooperate with God in obedience, but you get to decide if you're going to do it. What that means is nobody in this room is too old to be engaged. It means we do not have the luxury of using the excuse that we've been there, done that. We know, also don't get to say, well, we've never done it that way before. This is going to look different for every single one of us as we do this together. And as we unpack and unfold God's vision for us, you're going to feel God's tug to get involved some way, somehow, and that's great. But I'm telling you, don't wait for that. Do it now. You know how many places are already getting engaged right now as we go through this? We need someone to lead our children's ministry. Uh, Ginny's, who's been doing this so well for so long, needs a break. And we need someone to step up and take ownership of the children's ministry on Sunday morning. Talk to me. It's not a hard job, but it might intimidate you. I'd love to see someone do that. There are roles in our worship team. Just ask Faith. She would love to have more people. It is not a closed group. Except to me, because no one wants to hear me sing. Right? 
Youth for Truth, they have a whole bunch of people serving that, but they could always use more people. Come be part of kids' lives. We have this mentoring program I didn't put up there just because it's not really open anymore. If you didn't come to the training, you're kind of out of luck. But we had a bunch of people step up to say, I want to help be with teenagers. By the way, you see how these things, Youth for Truth, teenagers are all feeding in towards where we're going as a church, right? It's all very intentional. The youth group needs leaders, administrators, and coordinators. Again, we have people that have been doing this for years. They need people to come alongside. They don't need someone to be in charge. They just need someone to come be with teenagers and hang out. And it's fun. Literally, it's fun. Because they had a scavenger hunt the other night, and they rang our doorbell <laughs> and stole a ton of things from our house and then left. It was actually really cool. Okay? So was... <laughs> Next year, we have a missions trip. Come on this. It's great. We are going to be telling you more about this. This will be in late June, early July. Next year, we're going to be going... Um, Somewhere warmer, which may not be great in June, but we're going to go have a great time on a missions trip. Life groups are relaunching again in September. If you're in one already, fantastic. If you're not, get in one. Because if God is inviting you to do that and you have an excuse, then maybe there's no more wisdom coming your way until you listen. And develop a relationship with someone who doesn't know Jesus. In your neighborhood, where you live, at your job. And this is all fun because it means you're going to have to change your schedule. You're going to have to change your priorities. You're going to have to use your resources. But God is up to something. Here. 